<laughs> right here distinctly right in front of me. Uh, I take that as a sign. <laughs> you got a certain amount of time and that's it. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning. I, I know what a struggle it is to be without a pastor, particularly as long as y'all had Joel's pastor. And to be without, I've been through this a couple of times, two or three times, in fact, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come and help y'all out some. Uh, I'm sorry my wife couldn't be here this morning, as I've told others here this morning. She's sick, been sick since Thursday. She's uh, pretty, pretty sick. But, uh, well, like I said, I wish she could be here. Uh, I do have something important to mention before we get started here this morning, great importance. And that's this, that uh, you Georgia fans out here, cheer up. It'll get better. <laughs> you can't win a national championship every year. I'm a casual, casual college football fan. I'm a rabid Braves fan, so I know a little bit about disappointment. And I promise you it'll get better. Another thing I did want to mention, I've already mentioned to some this morning, if – you say something to me and it doesn't, my response doesn't make a lot of sense, is because I'm very hard of hearing. You'll notice if you get close, I'm wearing two hearing aids. So if you ask me about the weather and I tell you I prefer mine grilled or something like this, I'm not being a smart aleck, I just can't hear. All right, now since we're through with foolishness, let's let's move into our scripture here this morning. If you would turn with me to Second Thessalonians chapter three. Second Thessalonians chapter three. This is actually a lesson I taught a few weeks ago, and it seemed to be well received. And I hope you don't mind a rehash of something, but uh, y'all hadn't heard it, so. Hopefully, the Lord will bless what we teach here this morning. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and let's read the first five verses to begin with. It says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God unto the patient waiting for Christ. Now Paul, he's uh, written this letter to the church here at Thessalonica and he's starting to uh, wind it down and he's starting to move into some practical teaching. Uh, he's, he's spoken to the church already about the return of Jesus and he's also gone in in chapter 2 uh, about some of the events that would take place beforehand. And now he's moving into the direction of how they are to conduct themselves until this time, until Jesus' return. And that's pretty consistent with most all of Paul's letters. He, he usually uh, covers doctrine and then moves into a practical application. And first he says, he asked the church, he says, pray for me. And not only for himself, but for Silas and Timothy, who was accompanying him on this missionary journey. And he said, and I quote, the word of the Lord may have free course or run and be glorified even as it is with you. Uh, Paul, when he came into Thessalonica, he and, and his companions here, they, the Lord had blessed that ministry. They had came in, our people were saved, the word was received, uh, a church was established, a, a successful church. A church is described uh, in, in 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, and 4 as one that was a loving church. And it was a church that was steadfast in the face of persecution. Like all these churches, they had their share, fair share of troubles. Uh, and Paul was experiencing the same thing over at Corinth where he's writing this letter from. Uh, in Corinth, Paul had a group of unbelieving Jews that were opposing him. And he's now asking the church to pray for him that the, the, the ministry may have a, a free course or a run. They may have run of the place just like we did in Thessalonica. Pray that the Lord will bless us just like he did there. And one of the reasons 
that we've already touched on here, but we'll really look at here in the, in the next thing that Paul said. He asked that they pray that they be delivered from unreasonable or unsuitable, improper, wicked men. He says, for all men have not faith. Once again, Paul was facing these unbelieving Jews. They had went to the authorities uh, to try to get them shut down. And actually it backfired on them. Acts 18, we read where they came and tried to get them shut down. And actually the ruler of the synagogue was carried out and beaten for cause of the disturbance. But Paul says, you know, look, fellas, women, everybody don't have faith. And there's a difference between an unbeliever that just wants to be left alone and those that they don't want the name of Jesus to be spoken anywhere. We see it every day. It, it disturbs them that people are being saved, that anybody is honoring the name of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, I need prayer to deal with people like this. And you know, we still need it today because we still have the same kind. And Paul knew, he knew that this church in Thessalonica was facing persecution just like he was over in Corinth. And he encouraged them by saying, the Lord is faithful who shall establish or set fast like setting in stone and concrete. He shall establish you and keep you from evil. Paul was proud of the way this church had conducted themselves, how they had held up under persecution. And he makes it clear as to why they were able to do this. He said, because the Lord is faithful. He said, your anchor is the Lord. That's his grace that's holding you up. He told the church, he says, he had confidence in the Lord touching you, that you both do and will do the things which we command you. It was God that caused them to remain faithful. Wasn't anything inherently good in them. Everything they had preached to these people, he prayed they would be able to practice and that the Lord would make them able to do these things. And Paul's desire was, he says, that the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. He said, I pray that the Lord gives you the strength to patiently wait on the return of our Lord. Now, Paul said all that to say this, and we're going to read the rest of our text here in just a moment to set this up. He said, my desire is to see this work continue, that the work continue in Corinth, that the Lord, you understand, is the author of your strength and your faith. And now I'm fixed to tell you what he's directing you to do. The Lord saved you by his grace and he started this work, but that doesn't mean you don't have a responsibility. He says, I'm fixing to explain to you what your part is to do. Have you ever heard a sermon, and I'm sure you have, all of us probably have, sometimes a man preaches a sermon and it's so vague and it's so broad that when he gets through, you're really not sure what it meant, what it was about. And usually I, I, I feel like that comes from one, they're afraid they're going to offend somebody or they're afraid they're going to go out on a limb and say something that they can't doctrinally defend. So they just stay in their nice little warm cubicle inside their little bubble and don't get out and don't get to where the rubber meets the road. Paul's not doing this here. He's, he's given his broad statement. The Lord is responsible for all this. Not that we're, we're belittling that, but the Lord is first in all things. Now this is what he requires of you. I guarantee you when Paul, they was through reading this letter in the church, they had no doubt what Paul was saying. And I pray that we won't have any doubt this morning. Let's continue to read. Let's read verses 6 through 15 where it says, And now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that ye, we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. But even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. 
For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. <clears throat> Excuse me. But ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So here we have the apostle moving into the rules of conduct within the Lord's church. Now, if we notice something right off here, in verse 6, these rules are given, he says, now we command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This isn't a suggestion. This is a direct order from God through his servant. There's no higher authority that we can go to. This isn't something he says, you know, if you want to do this, this might work out for you. This may be something that you might want to look at. No, he says, I command you. Jesus Christ gave me this word, and I command you in his name to follow this. And he's right up front. He says, withdraw or avoid a brother or a fellow church member that walketh disorderly. And this word disorderly means irregularly. It's a used lot for a military term back in the day. Uh, people would get out of rank, out of file, out of line. He said, if you have a brother that's out of line, that's out of order, not following the principles that we taught when we were here, as we were given by Jesus Christ, avoid him. Now, we'll find as we continue into this, this study here this morning that this isn't just general unruly behavior. This isn't just a, a, a blanket statement that covers all things. Now, it could. It could. This would apply to any, any type of unruly behavior. But this, is, this has an emphasis attached to it. This is pointed at those that were unwilling to work. And it was going to allow the church to take care of their every need. And this seems to have been a big issue in Thessalonica because this is the third time that we see where Paul mentions it. Uh, back in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, and 12, he mentions it. And, and in chapter 3 and verse 10 of our text here, uh, he speaks of it, that he had already mentioned this when he was here bodily. And now he's speaking of again. This seems to be an ongoing problem in Thessalonica for people that didn't want to work for a living. Now, in the last chapter, if you were to go back and look at it, you would see that there were some that were going around saying that Jesus' return was upon them. He's fixing to come back, and he's fixing to come back now which was false because nobody knows. Jesus said no man would know the day and the hour. And Paul even want, went on to say, look, there's some things got to happen first. So you can imagine those that were falsely claiming that Jesus was about to return were probably quitting their jobs. What's the reason to go on and work? I mean, we fixed to leave this place. We're gone. Now, I'm sure that there were some that were probably already taking advantage of the daily ministration of the church. The, the tables were set for the widows, for the orphans, for the needy, and I'm sure there were many that showed up around mealtime to get a free lunch. And when you threw the gas on the fire by saying, well, Jesus is fixing to return. I mean, it's going to be this week. Well, let's all eat. Don't worry about working. Is this not common among lazy people? The lazy will always find an excuse to be idle and leech off of others. The Proverbs tell us, Proverbs 26 and verse 16, it says, the sluggard is wiser in his own conceit 
that seven men that can render a season. Lazy's well, never going to run out of excuse. Why don't you have a job? Well, I, I, I've been down on my luck for how long? Oh, well, for three years. You haven't been able to find a job three years in this area? There's people begging for, oh, yeah, yeah but I, I don't have a, have a driver's license. Well, I'm sure you could find a job within walking distance. You could pick up a ride, something. They always have an excuse. The church is commanded by the apostle here to withdraw, to avoid these. Don't listen to these excuses. Avoid them. Now, it's unclear, or it is to me, whether this is to go so far. I don't think it is to exclude them from the Lord's table, from the Lord's supper. But one thing's for sure, I think it, I know it is, when we get further we'll see this, exclude them from the daily ministration. They come and they show up to eat with the widows and the orphans today. No. You're not welcome here. And it's definitely they were supposed to exp express displeasure. Now, we don't go along with this. You want work? You want to be... To, to be a bum and to freeload? No. And there's no doubt that this is a public censure, as we see as we go further. This is a form of, of discipline directed at them. They were disorderly, so they were to be called out upon it publicly. You know, you don't have to be a drunk or a thief or a fornicator or anything like that to be out of order in the Lord's church. A refusal to work is a serious offense. If you don't believe it, ask Paul. This isn't the rules according to me. This is the apostle that was taught directly by Jesus Christ. These are pretty pointed things he's saying in this letter. In verses 7 8, he explains to them that these Thessalonians knew better. He said, You know how we conducted ourselves when we were here before. When they were there bodily, when they was in Thessalonica, when they was there establishing the church and preaching the gospel and, and performing this ministry, he says, we taught you better. And we taught you not only better by word, but by example. Instead of depending on the church to take care of, of Paul and Silas and Timothy, they worked a secular job. Paul mentions this in his first letter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9. I suspect he probably was as a tent maker since this was Paul's uh, trade as we find out in the book of Acts in Acts 18. And Paul often used this to support himself because he had a trade. I suspect he brought the other two fellows along, taught them as well, and this is how they survived. And Paul said here in this letter, he says, they work with labor and travail night and day. I may have the order wrong, but I suspect they were so intense in the daytime and preaching the word at night. May have been the other way around. I don't know. But what he was saying is, look, we worked. We worked hard. We did the Lord's work, and we supported ourselves. And the reason they did this, he explains. He said so that anybody else wouldn't be chargeable. This word chargeable means burdensome. He said, we didn't want to put a burden on anybody else. You know, times was not exactly like they are now where you had a pantry full of food and people struggled to get by sometimes. He said, we didn't want to go in there and put three grown men in a house that were already struggling to feed the family. Paul was never in favor of constantly burdening others while those that were, were supplying were never receiving anything back. In 2 Corinthians 8, verses 13 and 14, Paul said, For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burden, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. Charity is not supposed to just flow in one direction. It should be reciprocal. When we see one that is constantly 
receiving the fruits of others' labors and never giving back. That's not what Jesus intended. Always the receiver, never the supplier. Always the beneficiary, never the supporter. You know, our government's big on this. We have people that, that, that they reward for being sorry. They live their whole lives off of other people's sweat, and they never, ever give anything back. Paul made it clear that this is not what the Lord intended. In verse 9, he explains that when they were in Thessalonica, he and, and, and Silas and Timothy, that they didn't not take support from the church because they had to. He said they had the power, and this word actually means in the Greek the privilege of being preachers of the gospel. They had the right to be provided for. Just like Paul said in his letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 6, or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? It simply means to not work. Would it be wrong for me and, me and Silas, or excuse me, Barnabas to not work? No. We have the power to do that. And he explains it in, in verse 14 of the same chapter. He said, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live with the gospel. Makes it plain. We were preachers of the gospel. There would have been not one thing wrong if we had came in here and the church had provided for us. That's what, the way the system the Lord set up. They could have set, accepted provisions from the church just like they could have in Thessalonica, but he says they wanted to set an example unto you to follow us. Nobody could ever accuse Paul and Timothy and Silas of being freeloaders. They worked and they preached. So none of these loafers could ever come up and say, wait a minute, Paul, I don't want to hear all this. You remember when you came here, if it hadn't been for us, you'd have starved to death. No, I don't, I'm not going to hear it because we worked and you can too. In verse 10, Paul makes it very clear that this laziness should not be given any aid comfort. He reminds them that he told them when he was there before, when he was bodily present in Thessalonica, he says that if any man would not work, neither should he eat. Now, I don't think that one's up for debate. This is pretty clear. No gray area. He said, if they don't work, they don't eat. They don't come to the table that the, that, that the deacons have set up for the widows and the orphans. If they don't want to work, don't you dare give them nothing off of that table. This is a suggestion. He once again said, this is a command. Paul's basically saying, if you got a problem with this, you take it up with the Lord. Because he's the one that taught me. There was no charity to be extended towards the sluggard. As we said, this table was off limits to him. Laziness was not to be tolerated. Paul said later in his first letter that he wrote to Timothy, when, after Timothy became a pastor, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8, he says, but if any provide not for his own, and especially... For those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Paul did not think highly of men that allowed their families to suffer and didn't provide for. This is not some minor infraction. This it, oh, he's a pretty good fella. He just don't really like to work. No. Paul said this makes one worse than an infidel, an unbeliever. A unbeliever would not act this bad. Paul had an answer for this. And this didn't just begin with Paul. This goes back, we can go back and look in the Old Testament. Proverbs 8:16 and verse 26 says, He that laboreth, laboreth for himself, for his mouth craveth it, craveth it of him. What was this proverb, uh, proverb say? He gets hungry enough, he'll go find a job. 
This didn't just start with Paul. Paul went even further into this. Not only was this a violation of, of God's principles to not work and not provide for your own, he said, there's even more damage that's done by this disconduct. He said that these, in verse 11, these disorderly or out of line brothers not only refused to work, but he said they would become busybodies as well. And the word busybody, the definition here in the Greek actually is the key to understanding part of this. I mean, it's pretty, pretty well laid out, but we could really get a more in-depth look at it. This word means, busybody means to walk around or to overdo. They weren't, they weren't overdue doing work, that's for sure. They weren't busy at work, but instead they were busy at tending to other people's business. They were overstepping their bounds, sticking their nose where they didn't have any business. Normally, when you see somebody that's a loafer that won't work, you find that they're gossips and they're meddlers. Very seldom do we not see that follow. I guarantee you, every one of us in here just thought of somebody that we know that's like that. They don't work. They go around from here to here to here, spreading all the rumors and all the gossip. A lot of it not true, just as long as they can find something to tell, then this is how they spend their time, working in other people's affairs. This is not the only place in the Bible that this type of behavior is condemned. Peter. Another apostle, Peter said in his first epistle, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 15, he said that no Christian should operate this way. He said he shouldn't operate as, in our quote, as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Now that's pretty rough company, isn't it? Murderers, thieves, evildoers in general and busybodies. Paul, in his advice to Timothy, after Timothy became a pastor, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 11, concerning the young widows, he was explaining to Timothy how things were to be carried out and, and about the daily ministration to the widows and, and to the needy and all the different ways to handle uh, church matters. He said these younger widows he said in, in chapter 5 and verse 11 of the first letter to Timothy, he said they should be excluded from the daily ministry of the church. Well, why? He says, I recommend that you allow them time to remarry. And then when they remarry, they can spend their time doing what a godly woman should do, taking care of their homes, taking care of their families and their husbands. If not, you know what's going to happen and, and Paul, well, we'll finish this in just a moment. He says they're going to become welfare queens. Now, I know that's an ugly word to many people today. Oh, that, that's a terrible phrase that should never be used. But it isn't exactly what Paul's explaining here, and we'll see here in just a minute. Paul was saying if you take these, these young widows that are still of marrying age, childbearing age, that most likely we'll find another husband. If you start taking care of them, make them so comfortable that they become the aforementioned welfare queens, they would, and this is what he says in chapter 5 and verse 13 of 1 Timothy, he said they would learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. Sounds like the term welfare queen's biblical to me. He says they're going to, they, they learn to be idle. You, you will actually entice them to do nothing. Why would they want to do anything when you're providing for their every need? And then once they get their belly full, then it's time to go over here to this house and to that house and to tattle and to run their mouth. And guess what happens then? They're members of the church. They start to tear a church apart. Paul said, don't provide for them. 
They're young. They're still able. If they have to, they can work until they remarry. Do not turn these women into this. You know, even if we're retired, I was talking to brother here before church. I'm retired, semi-retired. I still work some uh, when I'm not hunting and fishing. Uh, I still work. And, and if the Lord's blessed you to be independently wealthy, where you don't have to hit a lick at anything, you know, we still have things to do. We still have responsibilities. We still have grass to cut, meals to cook, and, and cleaning to do, and maintenance on our homes and our vehicles. We stay busy at something. You know, this is, is nothing new. This has always been the way it is. And we'll look more at that in just a second. Paul said in verse 12 that the Lord Jesus Christ exhorted from the Lord, uh, exhortation from the Lord Jesus Christ, he commanded that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Paul said, once again, this isn't my words, this is what Jesus taught me. He said, for you to work and mind your own business. Now, does this not destroy the myth that's been perpetuated that Jesus was a socialist. You see it all the time. All the different, the, 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 a lot of liberals just throws that out there. You call yourself a Christian, and yet Jesus, he fed the, the flocks. He fed the masses, and, 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 and everything was common within the church. If Jesus was a socialist, why would he command this? You were and mind your own business, unless the people were too young or too old are uh, disabled and couldn't work. They want to muddy the water. Paul makes it clear. Jesus made it clear. Nowhere do we find in Scripture any grounds for free cell phones and student loan forgiveness and daycare for single mothers to turn out more children to receive more welfare nor any of these other ungodly government practices that we see today, enabling lazy people to continue to be lazy. And the, those that are supporting them have to suffer, and you have to give away your or money that you earn by the sweat of your brow. Sadly, they would many be infuriated to hear this, these words this morning. What choice do we have? It's a command from Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't promote socialism. What he commanded was that one should eat and mind their own business. And does not create a happy environment? How peaceful can it possibly be that when you go out and you work and you come home and mind your own business, you don't have problems that you would when you're out running around here from house to house. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 19, Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given him power to eat thereof.